Good morning, everyone. Have you ever heard about Creative and Productive Hub or third places or hybrid spaces? Are you familiar with the Fab City movement, for instance, or Fab City Global Initiative? If not, and if you would like to learn more, this is the right uh, space for you, the right events. I'm Francesco. This is Fab City Hub Voices podcast. Fab City Hub Voices is a series of webinars in which you can learn about uh, how to activate such creative spaces or creative hubs, and also about the challenges that are involved into activating these spaces. But especially you can learn how this uh, space of innovation can unlock a potential for positive impact in the local ecosystem. So this program is produced by Volumes. Volumes is a uh, creative studio based in Paris. Uh, with a long experience in uh, creating, uh, running, and supporting the emergence of new creative hubs in Europe and soon in the world. Uh, this initiative of the podcast is part of the pro a project called Centrino, a European project, uh, a part of the H2020 program, in which Volume is supporting uh, nine Fab City hubs uh, in Europe in nine different cities, the first of which recently opened its door a few months ago in Paris. So Fab City Hub Paris is the first Fab City Hub of the world, but we have eight more coming. Um, and uh, the one we are presenting today is uh, from Blondwos. And before I go on with uh, the presentation, I want to introduce our main guest today, Ragnar, who is speaking from Blondwos. How Raga, how are you? Uh, Hello. Hi, how is I'm the fine. weather? How is the weather uh, in London? It's good right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks for being with us. So Raga uh, has a background in education and uh, art and craft. She's an expert in textile and uh, weaving techniques. Mm -hmm. And as I said, she's speaking from Blondo, specifically the textile lab in which uh, she teach uh, and she's an expert of a machine, a specific machine that we'll discover during the presentation today called, if I'm not wrong, TC2 Loom. Is this correct? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. And um, yeah, and also um, uh, we have uh, with us today Carlotta, of course. Carlotta is part of uh, Volumes team. She's leading the Centrino project uh, in Volumes. She's uh, an urbanist, architect, and researcher. And she spent the last uh, two years and a half, if, I, if I'm not wrong, researching about uh, the history of creative hubs in Europe, the different typologies, uh, the different um, um, yeah, uh, governance model, business model, etc. And she will be uh, with us to guide us through this interview with Raka, also asking some questions and giving us highlights uh, from a research perspective. How are you, Carlotta, and where are you speaking from? Hello, everybody. Hello, Raka. Hello, Francesco. I'm uh, currently in Italy. Uh, I just visited uh, Milan that organized a very interesting uh, festival about uh, circular production, mm -hmm. uh, um, subjects that are very related with the uh, Centrino. Um, and I will be here with you, with Raka, and listening about uh, the progress that the Fab City Hub in Blondus are doing. And I will take in care also of the, your question. There is a chat and do not hesitate to present yourself, put some question that we will be happy to answer with uh, Raka and um, yeah. yeah so exactly thanks. exactly as Carlotta is saying for those of you who are joining the event for the first time this is an open event it's open to the public we have people listening from different parts of the of Europe maybe of the world it's the idea is that uh, now we will uh, listen to Raka who will share a presentation about uh, her expertise and also where they are uh, cooking uh, in uh, the textile lab in Blondos with textile and weaving uh, techniques. Uh, but 
The idea is that during the presentation, you can use the chat to ask uh, and note down some questions, which we will try to uh, answer if we can uh, after the presentation with the support of Raka and also with the, the expertise of Carlotta. So um, last thing before we go, I want to remind that this is um, this podcast is also uh, recorded and shared uh, by volume after the event, and also it will be published in the Centrino website. So if you want to share it with someone afterwards, you can, and also you can come back and watch the specific section of the of the webinar. So Raka, if you are okay with that, you can yeah. go, floor okay. is yours. And I will share the screen here. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. And I will go here. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank perfect. You. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, to start with, I my name is Ragnheiður, and I'm always called Raka, so just have that. And uh, I will be present. Uh, I will be presenting the the Fab City Boys from Blandos pilot. And I will be uh, emphasizing on weaving and textiles, mostly on weaving, because I am the weaving expert here. And we can say that all this uh, this long walk to the textile to the textile lab and to the Fab City Hub here was through weaving, because that was the beginning in 2016. So that's why we are emphasizing on that. So just to be clear on that. Uh, but uh, to begin with, the, the textile center of, of Iceland is located in Blundos. It's a small town here. And the textile center was founded in 2005 uh, to promote and develop Icelandic and international textile. That was the goal. But, uh, different people were there, were working here then, and everything has changed a lot. It is, it is dom domiciliated under the roof of the historical building of Kvennaskolin. Kvennaskolin meaning women's college. And we also have the OS residency, who provides visiting students, scholar and artists with working space to conduct their artistic practice, research and study trips within textiles. The center is led by a governing board from the region and from all over Iceland, from the universities and associations and businesses. And one of the main goal of the textile center is to, co is to contribute to the recreation of a new type of textile industry in Iceland. And emphasize on local production using sustainable resources like the Icelandic wool. The Icelandic wool is really our gold in Iceland. It has been always. So that will be our main goal. Uh, also, if we go to the objective of the, the Blendos pilot is to further develop the Icelandic Textile Center, strengthening the, the, lively, the li lively textile hub and center and textile education, research and, and innovation. To build, building the bridge between traditional handcraft and digital technology. That's the main goal of our work here. And to create and develop the textile lab, a maker space where scholars, students, artists, and makers have access to expertise, work facilities, and digital equipment for textile work and experimentation. Learn new skills and, and with, the, the, with the principle of circular economy in mind. We try to make that always a big issue here. To focus on the use of sustainable materials, local resources, as the Icelandic wool, the fish, fish skin, we have a fish skin factory just like 30 minutes drive from here, and seaweed. And to develop works, workshops and vocational training, increasing knowledge and raising awareness on topics such as textile waste, circular economy, sustainability and the potential of textile innovation, e-textiles and biotextiles. To research and current, current situation, historical heritage and general dimension of domestic craft and textiles work in Iceland. 
And that is, we are working in collaboration with the University of Iceland. So, but, but why weaving? And that's mainly because I'm a weaver and I'm a weaving expert. I've been a, a professor at, at, the, at the college in Akureyri in the art department for many years. I've been teaching weaving. I've been expert here. So I, weaving is my thing. And I'm just going to skip some of my slides because they are not, you can look at them later. And this is just something that I put in here because I thought it was very important because weaving used to be one of the, one of the most important thing all over the place, everywhere in the world, because we had to have, we had to make our own fabric so we could dress. So, but uh, this is uh, the, the uh, earliest map that we have, the oldest map that we have of Iceland. Uh, it has changed a lot, especially the south coast. And this is how people saw Iceland when they came here around 874 to 900. So, and I'm going to, I'm going to be very quick going through the four state, four states of weaving in Iceland, because for 900 years, we used the warp weighted loom from 900 to, to, it was very important to 1650, then fishery came in and knitting and uh, but we were using the warp weighted loom up to around 1800, which was much more, much longer than everywhere else in Europe. And then came this entrepreneur, the Icelandic guy, in 1751. He started the first. Uh, he he started the first industry in Iceland, if we could could call it that. And he imported to Iceland cloth looms, horizontal looms, and spinning wheels. So it was the first states of industry. And then in 1900 to 1990, we had big, big weaving and spinning factories in two places in, in Iceland. So we had one in near Reykjavik and one in Akureyri, where I, where I live. And we produced a lot of things for, for export, mostly to, to USA and, and uh, former Soviet Union. And then in 1990, the whole industry of textile collapsed in Europe, not just in Iceland, but everywhere, because the Soviet Union collapsed. So then we had this gap, no factory, nothing produced in Iceland. Then we, there were established two knitting factories in Iceland. One is in the south and one is in the north. So near here to Blantos. So we are, we are producing knitted fabric. And then in 2016, I started to work at the textile center, uh, 2015, 16, something like that. And then the textile center in Blenzos bought the first TC2 loom to Iceland. TC2 stands for thread control. So it's computerized loom, uh, very, very uh, technology. Uh, well, the, you can do almost everything in TC2 loom because you, you control each and every thread of the loom. So that's the beginning of the four states. And that's our, uh, that's our vision in the future to see some changes in the weaving, uh, in the production of weaving in Iceland. And I hope we will make it. I don't know. And just very quick, go through this history. This is the, the spindle that was used. And this is the fleece, uh, the Icelandic gold, if we can call it, call it that, we sometimes use, use the frame wool is the gold or wool is the similar to gold in Iceland because that's, we would not have survived in this country if we wouldn't have this, the sheep and the wool. Because of the cold here, the cold climate, we had to knit and weave all our clothes and everything comes from this wonderful sheep. And because the Icelandic wool from the sea is very special, it has two sets of layers. It has something that is called thel, it, that's very soft, it can be almost like silk. And then we have the tog that is, it's very hard, harsh and more, uh, it's itchy when you, when you wear it. So these two layers were always separated in the old days and they were spun separately. But nowadays they are spun together. That's why Icelandic lope or wool for knitting is so itchy because we are not working the wool as we used to do. 
you're not you're not separating the wool except in one factory in Iceland, the spinnery. Here you can see all these wonderful colors of the fleece. And there, I mean, we can mix them and they are, the, but these are the main colors that are product, produced in Icelandic Lopi and Icelandic uh, one plight wool band. And yeah, so weaving was the most important thing. And we, uh, from the settlement period in 900, we we used to export a lot of wool, a lot of lot of uh, goods, uh, woven goods. Uh, we it was twill and something called shaki pile weaving and fine twill. So we pay taxes to Norway with with twill weaving. So it was super important. And this is the old loom that we used, and we used it for like. 500 years longer than every other European country. So here are the two types, Icelandic type. We invented something. We, we changed the war plated loom in Iceland. And that seems to be the only country in, in the world that did that. And we did that to speed up the process. So we could weave faster and also with 12 meters long warp instead of three meters. So just... Um, Quickly, plain weave. I don't know if you know plain weave. That's just uh, over under one and one. So just to show you, this is a sock that was woven. So something that has been excavated near Blandos, where we had the cloister. And this is plain weave. Everyone in Iceland had a bad spread like this. This is weft based, so you can't really see the, the warp. You can only see the weft. And everyone had to have a bad spread like this. Everything worked, everything woven in every household in Iceland. And some people say that we had looms, warp plated looms, and then looms in almost every, every farm everywhere in Iceland. Everyone knew how to weave. It was something, uh, something that just people had to learn. So, and this is just balanced weave, plain weave, and we could spin like this, which is amazing because the factories today are not spinning like this, because you can see that it's 52 double ends per inch. And when I first saw this fabric, I thought it was I thought it was uh, cotton, but it's Icelandic wool, and it's absolutely beautiful. And it's on a display here at the textile museum in Blandos. It's amazing how we did and how skillful weavers and spinners were in Iceland 100 years ago. And this is a two by two twill. This was our main uh, currency in Iceland because twill was the currency. Everything was measured in twill weaving. So if you were buying something like a cow or a sheep or something, we had to buy, we had to pay in so and so many, many islands of twill. So it was the main currency. And here is the diamond twill, just a replica of, of the finest twill that we did. And here is the famous Vararfelder, which was also for 500 years, we exported Vararfelder to Bergen in Norway. And then we paid, we, it was sold all over Europe. It was like a fashion, uh, fashion garment that men only wear. wear. So it's like woven uh, fur. It's everyone thought it was was a, a fur that you were wearing, but it's a woven garment, very special. And now we are reinventing this garment, and we are using this technique again here. So here is about the Vanerfelter. Um, in the oldest law book of Iceland, we have the description how how it was supposed to be, how it was measured one by two meters and and the the twill was the weaving technique and then you would in inlay the the piles into the weaving as long as you were weaving it so it was very special and here you can see how it looked and it's like a fur it's like you're just taking the fur from the sheep but it's a woven fur and we also did cross weaving in Iceland. This is also a bad spread and monk's bed. Every, every, all of these techniques 
were woven on the warp faded loom. And then they were just, uh, when the cloth loom or the horizontal loom came to Iceland, we kind of just put that, we wove that on that loom too. And here is one of the, the most beautiful and unique technique in weaving, and that, that's the Icelandic glit. It's, it's a tabby based coverlet because every woman in Iceland had to have a saddle blanket to ride from one farm to the next farm because it's very cold here. So she wrapped these blankets around her and they were all, always very beautifully decorated with black warp and weft and then naturally dyed colors on top of it. Beautiful. And here it's just woven. And this is also something we did, the floss weaving. And then the question is, why didn't we embrace the new loom? Because weaving was so super important and we were exporting all this weaving to get currency and to get uh, some goods to Iceland. And that's a big question that no one has been able to answer, but that maybe there are many answers. Uh, one of them is the, the one that I find very fascinating is that it weaving used to be female dominant. It was it was only women that wove on the on the warp faded loom, but the horizontal loom was always uh, men were weaving on the horizontal loom. That's one thing. And also we had this catastrophic volcano eruption in Iceland. Uh, and from the, the period of 1350 or something up to 1700, we had a very serious uh, uh, poverty in Iceland. And it was the, the, the most difficult, difficult times. So when a nation is on a brick of famine, it's very hard to make a major change such as introducing a new type of loom. So we just adjusted, we just adjusted the warp weighted loom to the uh, to the market in Europe. So we just elong we just put the long warp on the warp weighted loom. And I'm sure that the people in Bergen that were buying our textiles, our weaving, they didn't know that it was woven on a warp weighted loom. So it just we just adapted the we kind of Maybe we didn't cheat, but we didn't use the new loom. So, okay. And then the second stage, I hope I'm not wasting too much time. Uh, this is the, the stage when we try to build an industry in, in, uh, in Iceland. And uh, when the revolution, the industrial revolution was taking place in Europe and in, in, in UK, we were trying to adapt to the horizontal loom and the spinning wheel. So we were centuries uh, ahead of other countries. And there was this guy named Skule Magnusson, one of the richest guy in Iceland. He was the king's treasurer, the Danish king's treasurer, because the Danish people, the Danish king, ruled over Iceland from 16th century up to 1944. So he was the king's treasurer and he wanted to uh, change the, the he, he wanted to try to uh, better the industry he, he wanted to have new looms he had had he knew how to how to weave so he he brought a new loom to his his household uh, when he came home after his education in in Copenhagen and he wanted to uh, to uh, import looms so everyone in Iceland could use this new type of loom to speed up the the process you know to to sell more woven garments, woven cloth to, to Europe. But we are always located in Iceland and we have this, this, this harsh nature and always when we are trying to do something, we have big corruptions. And that's exactly what happened. When Skule had, had his industry established in Reykjavik, he got a lot of money from the Danish government, the Danish king, and he got men from all over Iceland to come and learn how to weave on these new looms. And he got the women to learn how to spin on the spinning wheel. But then we had the, the biggest eruption ever in Europe. So in eight, 1783, the, the famous Lakagir explosion began. And it was, uh, we had a lot of earthquakes and poisoned gas who came out of the, the volcano. And the eruption 
continued until, uh, until 1785. So it was two years of period. And it was it is still considered one of the greatest volcano eruption in the world. So the whole catastrophic that followed was named in Icelandic Móðu Harðindin. It's the mist hardship because there was like mist over the country for years. So it was everything, the crop and everything died. Ass and poisoned gases blocked the sun, killed crops, suffocated both people and cattle. So 25% of, of the Icelandic population died. And many of them just moved to, to Denmark or, or to US and Canada. So they were just immigrants. They fled the country. And 75% of the country's livestock died. So it was a very difficult period. And the school in Magnuson was bankrupt because he nothing could you know, save his industry in this hard con uh, circumstance, circumstances that they had in Iceland. So the devastating eruption is considered one of the main reasons why the new enterprise did not succeed. They were running it until 1801, but then finally it, it was closed down. But, but we had the spinning wheel and we had the loom in Iceland. So that was something. But it took us like 90 years to adapt from the warp weighted loom to the cloth loom. Okay, and then came spinning jenny. Uh, the chuck the shakat loom never came to Iceland. We had never we never had that technique. And I always play with the idea that we didn't have the shakat loom, but we have the digital shakat loom here in Plantos now because we have the TC2 loom, which is the you know it's it is a shakat. Uh, computer at Sakadum. And then we had these amazing wool factories in Iceland for all, almost 90 years. It began with a spinning factory called Aulafoss, and it was running until 1990. And Aulafoss is now uh, the East Tech spinnery in Iceland, which is one of the biggest in the country. And we have two mini mills that are spinning Icelandic wool. So we have this big spinnery, it's still running. And it was also an aquarelle, a spinnery, and, and the, we were weaving fabrics there too. So in aquarelle, there were all kinds of factories during the 20th century. It was like the most sustainable town in Iceland. We, were, we had shoe factories, knitting factories, tannery, weaving, and spinning factories. We were making clothes in one of the factories and so accurately was was completely because we were also in the food industry we were making foods too so we were completely sustainable and it was a great impact it had a great impact on the economy of iceland of course but then sadly it was closed down here's here you can see the the Aulafoss, and they used foss means means a uh, waterfall and they were they were they were producing electricity in the falls that you can see on the photo for the factory so it was very everything was very close and these houses are still standing and now they are like uh, artistic studios but no no factory there and the spinnery has been moved to a different building in 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 this small town near near Reykjavik but the weaving factory went bankrupt in 1990s. And this is from Akureyri, where I live. And I was lucky enough when I moved to Akureyri in 1986, then this, these factories were still running. So I could go there with my students and show them. But And I think nobody actually believed that they would go under, they would go bankrupt. But it did. And it, this is the big Gavion factories. And Gavion is the name of one of the goddesses of the Nordic mythology. So it's, it's a meaningful name. And people in Akureyri still misses these, miss these factories a lot. And sometimes we say it was the, it was the uh, probably the most, the biggest mistake that we have ever made was to close everything down there. So we had the spinning factories for like um, almost 100 years. And the, the spinning factory went bankrupt 
exclusively because of the Soviet Union collapse, because we were really putting all our eggs in the same our eggs in the same basket, as we can see, because we were we were the, our main our buyer were the Soviet Union. So when we lost our our trading uh, lines, then we couldn't survive. So they closed the business. Okay. So for more than 40, 30 years, we have no, had not had one uh, factory loom in Iceland. We have, we have to import everything. We have to import every fabric, every textile and everything we, we use in Iceland, which is very bad. We have these two knitting factories. And so that textile designers and, and, and fashion designers, they can, they can buy Icelandic knitted fabric, but not Icelandic woven fabric. So it's a bad idea not to have an industry loom in Iceland in the country. It's dangerous. We are in a no way sustainable nor environmentally friendly. And when we look at the production, when we look at the production of, of textile, and foresighted people in the textile business have been very worried about this for a long time. So it's always popping up every now and then. We have to do something about it. But no one has actually done anything. But we at the textile center there, we come in there. That was our main thinking in the beginning. We were always thinking about, okay, what can we co contribute to try to change this thinking of Iceland? How can we, what can we do? So the first step was that we bought the first TC2 loom. And just to introduce that to scholars and business people and designers in Iceland, we would we, we take small steps, but we are trying to change, change the, the situation in Iceland. And also in 2016, we had a grant, we applied for a grant for the Icelandic Innovation Technology Development Fund. And we got a grant for four years, so we could, we could establish our, our database on weaving. So we, we have a lot of old weaving samples and, and manuscripts of weaving. And I was leading that uh, research. So we digitized everything. So now it's in a database and it's, it's something that every student in Iceland and everywhere they can access this database and I know it's they're using it a lot so that's that was our first main project and research and it went very well and, and was a great success and we also took and the main thing was to take the old weaving patterns and weave them again in the TC2 looms and you can see some samples on the left side of the of the slide and these are just some, you can see, maybe if you know about weaving, you can recognize twill and undulated twill and all kinds of, of uh, familiar weaving structures there. So that was, the, that was a lot of fun. And we were like three people working on this, me and two of my assistants. And this was like four years project. And yeah, so, the, and then came, came Centrino and everything. So it has been growing a lot for the last two years. The Icelandic Texas Center has been completely shifted. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, and our main goal is to raise awareness and conduct and create, uh, I can't see the word there, and create a space for knowledge and marketplace. But we are, of course, we are not going to have factory here, that's for sure. But we are going to try to, to uh, have some impact on the society and the, the educational system in Iceland so we can start to think about that we can do something about this. And so we have, so we designers and inventors are interested in building this weaving Oh my God, I can't see this. In the in industry, Icelandic wool. Yes, we, so we are using Icelandic wool for fabric upholster. We, we want to make these things in Iceland because we have to do it. We can't just import everything and not export any weaving. We have to have a balance between import and export in the whole economic system of Iceland, of course. 
And within the framework of Centrino, the Textile Lab was created and opened like one and a half year ago in May 2021. The first of the kind in Iceland, and we there's no TC Tulum anywhere else in Iceland also. So it's I was hoping in 2016 that universities and school would buy TC Tulums, but they have not done that yet. So they come here with their students and we are teaching them how to weave on the TC Tulum. So yeah. We have two TC2 looms. We have a felt loom, laser cutter, laser printer, digital, digital embroidery machine, and digital knitting machine. We are on the right path toward the change in the field of textile, and, and we can see it. It is happening. For myself, I, I feel it's, it's, it, is, it is going very slow. But, you know, if I look at the uh, six or seven years period that I've been here, I can see a huge amount of changing has been taking place. And especially with the lab, which is completely uh, something that I had some vision about, but I never thought it would happen in my, <laughs> you know, when I was working here. So here you can see just something, some place, it's a big lab. We have we, our newest machine is the knitting machine, a big machine that we are still learning how to use. Here you can see our two TC2 looms and, and the felt loom is maybe the thing that is, it's, it's very easy to learn how to use the felt loom. So that's, so that's the machine that people, local people here are using, the children mm -hmm. from the schools and it's, it's very easy. The TC2 looms are of course more complex. So, Thank you. Questions? <laughs> yeah, Ranka. Thank you very that much was, for the presentation. It makes me. It it, that it was, makes that me. Was <laughs> yeah, it was for us. It was uh, super. Maybe for you it was tiring, but uh, <laughs> it was not too fast. I think for us. Okay. Um, yeah. It may. I was saying that uh, this presentation makes me wanting uh, come back to to the lab soon. <laughs> so I hope I will have the occasion. Uh, I just want to, uh, for the audience, to be precise that you are speaking today from the textile lab itself. This is one of the room now. This is more the the office space, and then you have uh, on your left, I think, is the machine, the machines, right? Uh, the the room with the machines is in the, the room? other room, right? Yeah, the room for, yeah, the rooms with machines are on my left. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Two yeah, yeah. extra rooms there. And yeah. here we sometimes we have the digital embroidery machine here, but now mm -hmm. it's inside there. So this is okay. an open. It's yeah. like a studio here. Yeah, it's very Great. messy. And everything yeah, is it's it's a lab, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lab. somehow it's somehow messy. Yeah. Um, some seaweed is lying around here everywhere because they're doing yeah. some seaweed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, by the way, also for the audience, uh, um, in some of the hubs, we used to talk about uh, clean rooms and dirty rooms, which yeah. I don't know if it's the case for you, but uh, we have this in Paris. Yeah. The clean room is where, the dirty room is where you do the production and you can have uh, a lot of uh, dirty pieces of uh, material. And then yeah, that's you, what I know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you have the, the clean room when you do the finishings, maybe the paintings in, in case of wood, etc. Uh, so we have uh we will take in a question. Carlotta has already prepared a, a, a series, more series of questions that are more focused on the research we are conducting in Centrino, but I'm not seeing a lot of questions from the audience. So I want to insist to everyone that uh feel free to please ask your questions there is no stupid there is no stupid questions even the most basic one the most concrete one are welcome because i remember I, I remind you that the idea of these webinars are to share um, experience from the ground of people that are uh, activating and have uh, are dealing with daily challenge of managing the space and uh, putting them together to run and to work. So feel free to use the chat or the question and answer in Zoom to ask the question. Maybe Carlotta, you get yeah. There's one here, Rachel. Yeah. yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. She is asking me why uh, why not a factory. 
a significant local fab fabrication out of our source, or is it, or in other words, is the fab lab concept of a city that product what the consume? Well, yeah, maybe yeah. I, I, we yeah. can answer with uh, two perspectives here. Uh, maybe I can give more the fab city perspective generally, but but yeah. from your side, Raka, maybe you can start by. The way I understand this question is when you mentioned uh, uh, that you are not a factory, but you are trying to change the ecosystem. Can you make a focus on what you mean by there? Which kind of change? Uh, and maybe maybe also say what do you mean why when you say we are not a factory because you are not one of of course. No, of course we are not. Uh... We, I mean, to have a factory to to build and to 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 um, to have to establish a factory in Iceland for the weaving industry costs a lot of money because, unfortunately, we did not keep any loom in Iceland, so they were all exported or they were just they were just taken apart and they are not they can't be used anymore. So we would have to start from zero. We would have to start. By to buy uh, all these equipments that we need for factory to, to have a weaving factory and the spinning factory that has to be alongside. So it is some. It's a big job for someone that has. We we need investors. We need people from the textile industry. So I have for many years. I have been in contact with the people with an, in the knitting business, trying to persuade them. Okay, why don't you add weaving? machines to this to your factory but up till now it has always been no we can't do that because it has everything went bankrupt i think people are still so much remembering how terrible it was when everything was closed down because in my hometown two thousand people lost their jobs you know so so it's like it was like a nightmare because everyone went out of work so we are still in the process to uh, remembering the old days and trying to forget that and establish a new thinking in Iceland. And there is a paradigm shift. We can we can feel it that people are in the first uh, for the first uh, maybe five years. People, everyone that I spoke to said no, no possibility. We have to import it. We can't produce woven te woven textiles in Iceland anymore. We we have tried it and it, we failed, but now people are yes maybe we can get there are new kinds of uh, looms that you can buy and the people the the market is changing we don't have to produce so much we can produce quality fabric quality um, uh, upholster quality blankets and we don't have to produce you know the mass production is what we would like to not to have here. We would like to have a small production of a, a quality fabric that we can sell expensively to people that want to buy it. So, and also for, for Icelandic designers to use. So it, it is changing. And I hope that people will, because the government is not gonna do it. We have to have some investors. We have to have people that are, have money and, are going to invest in this and believe in this industry. So yeah. that's that's what we are doing. We are just trying to plant the seeds, you know, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And if I can complete your answer, Raka, by the way, I, I also want to mention that uh, you are, the Texel Lab is not a factory, but uh, it, it, you are kind of connected to a factory that exists in the territory. When I was there, um, uh, when I was there uh, with uh, Elsa and all the team, we visited uh, some of the factories of the area and it was yeah. very interesting to see the challenges and the, the techniques that were using. Unfortunately, I don't have the name uh, in mind, but maybe Elsa can help us if she's with us in the chat. And to, re to reply with, with my Fab City hat uh, to Raphael, uh, the way we, we perceive uh, Fab City hubs, 
within Centrino and within the Fab, Fab City Global Initiative is precisely not uh, replacing factories with uh, these hubs, is more um, having these spaces that are able to interact with existing uh, you know, stakeholder of the industry and transform them and uh, support the, the stakeholder into a transition more than you know uh, building from scratch a factory and when it comes to you, the second part of your question rafael if uh, the fab city concept of cities produced um, what they consume uh, this is uh, uh, this has evolved uh, i'm speaking also from as a, a member of the, the Fab City Foundation uh, Supervisory Board. This has uh, evolved over time in the sense that now when uh, we go uh, to cities, we always uh, consider uh, the scale that is needed to achieve sustainability and self-production. Uh, so in some cases, uh, it, it's, it's, it's possible that a city, a city center is able to produce everything but uh, it comes more and more uh, realistic when you take into consideration the larger territory and the scale of the territory of the region you need to work with can change a lot uh, depending on local factors so yeah. it's more creating regions that are uh, self-sufficient more than city center or city by themselves uh, i'm seeing that uh, questions are are coming now. I don't know if Carlotta, you want to shoot one first and then we can yeah. go back to yeah, the maybe. live questions. Uh, one of my question, uh, you mean? Yeah, 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 if you want to go with one. Yeah, sure. But I would like to keep uh, discussing about this uh, dichotomy about uh, the Fab City Hub as the replacing factory or more supporting uh, the creation of a small, uh, uh, enterprise or improving their production to be more local and sustainable. So I don't know, Raga, if you can uh, provide us uh, maybe a small example of what type of collaboration you have had with the small medium enterprise or also another thing that I think would be interesting, how the, um, the existence of the textile lab uh, during these uh, two years that it has opened has attracted more uh, entrepreneurs to be more interested in collaborate with you and reflect upon new models of uh, fabrication etc if you can give an, an insight on that yeah well uh, my from my perspective what i have been doing mostly is to teach and to to have the the students from the design department the fashion design they from the University of Art in, in Reykjavik, they come here. And so we are just, we are taking very small steps and uh, and the de designer, the, the fashion design uh, association, the weavers association and the small um, association in Iceland, they come here, they have been coming here. We have been doing a lot of presentation uh, for all kinds of people, uh, but what I am missing mostly is maybe the people that uh, that the entrepreneurs, the people that have the money, because they have not been so keen on coming here. Because that's maybe maybe Elsa can tell you more about that. But I have not seen them around. They, I, I mean, the the government people have been here. We have had some ministers here. We have had uh, some. People from the from the parliament are coming here every now and then, and they are very impressed about this space. And but the link to the actual people that have the money is not yet here. So we are just. But I think it's very important that the students that are learning how to be a designer and are learning the 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 artistic way of 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 living that they come here and they use this space and they come here for to uh, at least one fashion designer came here last summer and she was she was making her fa own fabric on the tc2 loom i mean every small step and one of the students from from csm in london she did her final project here she came and she wove her 
her fabric to use in her final final line. So these small steps are taking place. But remember, we have only been here for one and a half years. So, <laughs> so it's. But like you said, you have had the. Uh, uh, the we have a new mayor in Blantos now, and he is more interested. It, it, it's always we always have to have people that are willing to listen to what we are saying and it is also it has to be i think it is also a gender issue mostly there are women here you know most of the people here are and that's where the university of iceland comes in they have been doing this research on the gender and, and handcraft for example so the question is uh, who is ruling the financial the capital in iceland it's mostly men unfortunately yeah. it's still <laughs> like that. even though we have a woman who is a vice president and all that still we can see that the main capital is run by men elsa is answering something um, we had we, many young entrepreneurs visiting yeah, us yeah. and doing yeah. research for their product like Studio Fletta, Yururari and others. Yeah, yeah. That's right. um, there is another question that maybe you already touched upon your relation with the university and the educational institution and Davide uh, was asking what exactly is the role of the university as a partner of the textile center? Maybe to understand better what kind of partnership uh, is uh, an agreement uh, or you have uh, like uh, some specific program, uh, some, some exchanges. Uh, and also I'm, I know I am adding a new layer, but I know that you have uh, many contact also with uh, the Fabri Academy and other international yes. projects. So maybe having uh, some details on that. I think the global dimension is very important also in your case. Mm. I, I think the Fabric Academy that is here in the Fab, Fab Lab here is absolutely amazing. So, I mean, we have here entrepreneurs and people that are taking the Fabric Academy and they are doing amazing things. So every time I come here, I see something new and something exciting. So that's also, uh, and when students, when my students came here in November, they were also very taken by everything that was happening here. The, the, the students at the Fabric Academy were working in the same play. We, we were all working here together. So they were sharing skills and sharing uh, ideas and everything. So we have to, of course, we have to start in the educational system. So we have, we are in collaboration with the University of Art with the Art School of Reykjavik and the University of Iceland. And also, I think we are also in collaboration with the university in, in Holar, which is a local university, like one hour drive from here, and the University of Akureyri. So yeah, there is a lot of things going on and so many things are happening. And I don't have all the whole picture, you know. Elsa is the one that maybe has the whole picture if, I did, if anyone has it then it's Elsa. So yeah, it has been, it has been such, okay, here's Thorkir Einarsdóttir also, she is from the University of Iceland. Uh, entrepreneurs in Iceland have not yet seen the value of textile. Yeah, that's what's, that's a very good answer. It's in, it's the last one here. Uh, but we hope that Centrino will help to make them visible. Yeah, I think that's very much the truth of it, because uh, we have to plant the seeds, we have to be very, we have been writing articles, we have been online, we are using Instagram and Facebook and and uh, the newspapers in Iceland to try to, to always, we are, we are always, we are always making ourselves visible everywhere. So, yeah, I think we are really trying to be seen and be heard, which is very important. And the more people that come with us into it, the, the more pro success we will have, I think, as a whole. Okay. And it's very important. Um, we should almost close the webinar, but I have a very, very direct question. Um, 
Have you been approached by, by some other uh, organization, not SME nor uh, uh, entrepreneur, but some others that would like to replicate the textile lab elsewhere in Iceland? Like, uh, okay, how have you done? We would like to replicate it in another area of Iceland. Yeah, because I am I am in the teachers association in Iceland and also in the textile uh, guild of Iceland and the textile people in Reykjavik are always asking, why don't we have textile lab in Reykjavik, for example? So people are, they are envious because we have this lab here and uh, hopefully they will have textile lab also in Reykjavik and maybe in in Akureyri too because we have this uh, we have university and two colleges in Akureyri and we have a textile department there and in 2012 uh, we were planning a textile lab in Akureyri but it never came to uh, function it's all it's the the lab that the fab lab is there but there is no textile lab so I think that when people see the lab here in, in Blantos, they want to replicate it in other places in, in Iceland. So yes, but it costs money. So, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, that's that's why the the sustainability and the business model behind those hubs is one of the main uh, topic that are being now discussed uh, within Centrino. And we are, um, by the way, publishing um, a git book uh, with a sort of uh, guide and toolkit to for those of uh, other cities that want to try to start a similar concept. Uh, uh -huh. So we, we hope that what we are doing in Centrino maybe will help also uh, what you are doing in Iceland. And uh, of course, uh, it's, it's normal that Reykjavik uh, want to have the same uh, the yeah. same lab uh, i mean i understand the dynamics of uh, you know the the city the capital uh, that look what happening in northern ireland mm -hmm. but also i mean the context is also very different the textile lab there would be i think very different from from yours uh, in any case what we preach a lot in volumes when we are reached out by, by uh, promoters or real estate operators that want to run hubs, the first thing we do is to explain that uh, this is not something you you take from one place, you put it in another place, and uh, it works like magic because there is a strong community component that you need to build. So in your case, for instance, without the expertise you have, the connection with the local ecosystem, the university, the lab would be a uh, an empty box no so this is a very important point unfortunately we need to close the webinar raka thank you very much for being with us thank uh, you and for inviting me uh, it's uh, you you were a perfect guest uh, i just want to close uh, saying uh, re reminding everyone that this webinar has been recorded is being recorded right now and will be available uh, on the centrino website and if you want to follow uh, all the news and upcoming uh, documents and report that we are producing, you can subscribe to social media of Centrino and of course also social media of volumes in which we regularly produce and uh, distribute the knowledge that we are uh, producing. So thank you everyone. Thank you Carlotta uh, for your questions and your guidance and uh, see you uh, in blonde was soon hopefully and see you with the audience for the next uh, edition of the fab city of voices 